Thank you so much for tuning in to Flowing Life, where we love God, love people, and we live life. This is living. John chapter 6, and you can bring me down in the house a little bit. Just make sure we're strong in the stream. Glory to God. Um, because I know, I know, I know, um, <clears throat> I know that depending on how we feel sometimes when we wake up in the morning will determine whether or not we thank God or we worship God the way that we really should. I don't want to lose nobody this morning. I hope y'all can stay with me. Um, depending on how the weather is when you get up in the morning, sometimes will determine your mood for how you feel getting started. Um, I know better. I know um, that, 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 that had it still been raining and lightning and thundering, right, when it was time for you to leave out the house, um, I know, not you, not, not any of y'all sitting in the seats, not, not, not anybody uh, uh, streaming online just because you're not in the city of Charlotte. But I know, generally speaking, um, a lot of people around the world, churches are still open on Sunday morning, even through the rain, through the thunder, through the lightning. But some people wake up and they see what's happening outside and make a determination of how their entire day is going to go based on what's happening. Somebody say outside. How do you handle adversity? That's what I asked the team this morning. If you want to gauge how spiritual you are, if you want to gauge how full of faith you are, it is measured by how you handle adversity. Somebody say adversity. We all handle it. We all do life. Life happens to everybody. In John chapter 6, oh my God, y'all, this is going to be good. This is going to be good. John chapter 6, if you're there, say, I'm there. If you're not there, say, give me a moment. All right, sounds like everybody's there. I'm going to say, give me a moment. My, play, my page is flipped. John chapter 6, this is what it says in verse 15. Um, there, therefore, when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king. Now, we're not talking about Jesus being arrested and he's about to die. We're talking about the multitudes swarming him because of the miracle signs and wonders. He had just fed 5,000 people, and now the people see, oh, man, this man is producing food. We hungry, so if nothing else, we know where to go for food, right? But he's doing miracle signs and wonders as well. So he says Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him as king by force. Uh, to make him king, he departed again to the mountain by himself alone. That could be a whole other message by itself. We're not stopping, stopping there. Now when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea. Evening came. It's dark outside. They're sailing in the dark. Keep that in mind. Um, got into the boat and went over the sea toward Capernaum. And it was already dark, and Jesus had not come to them. All right, y'all following this? The disciples are selling apart from Jesus. He's not with them. He sent them ahead of himself. And he said, I'll catch up with you a little bit later. I need to settle the people. All right, y'all still following me? Talk to me. Y'all still following me? In verse 18, then the sea arose because a great wind was blowing. So when they had rowed about three or four miles, Jesus Saw, I mean, uh, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and drawing near the boat, and they were afraid. But he said to them, it is I. Do not be afraid. Then they willingly received him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land where they were going. How do you handle adversity? Um, interesting to me that uh, they had no real way of knowing that this was Jesus. It was dark. The winds are rising. Now the waves are crashing. And then they see at a distance someone walking towards the boat. Right? We've, we've heard this story before, and we've got accustomed to it. We're numb to it already, and, and we, we, we think, okay, yeah, this is normal for Jesus to do. But put yourself in this situation. Right? If you're on a boat, 
first of all, I'm not really um, the type that will go out on a boat at night. Look, you was about to say in the first place. <laughs> Listen, because uh, um, now I can swim, but um, a, a lot of our persuasion cannot swim, right? I'm sure y'all got friends and family of the same complexion that do not know how to swim, right? So they wouldn't be out there in the first place, right? Um, but it's dark outside. I'm not going outside in a boat in the dark. I'm not going anywhere near the water that is not a pool in the dark. As a matter of fact, my wife would tell you she's from Alabama, and I know that alligators are in Alabama. We don't swim in lakes. I only heard one person say that's right. I guess everybody else does. I'm not going in any body of water in the dark. That is not a pool, and the pool better have lights. They're in the dark, in a boat, on the water. Everything's crashing around them. They see somebody walking towards them. They don't quite know it's Jesus. Um, they don't have modern technology, right? Um, Y'all remember rotary phones, right? Um, the little, uh, somebody, you know what a ro rotary phone is? <laughs> it's the phones ha have it, it's the phones that you got to put your finger in it has all the numbers in a circle and then you got to have you ever seen one of those before she's what's that you 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 have to turn it and 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 god forbid you get four numbers in and then you accidentally dial the wrong number and got to start all over <laughs> right I, I i know about this i i am i'm i ain't, I ain't too old but i mean I, i'm i'm old enough to know but still young enough to where i Anyway, so rotary phones, right? And then um, we is like, ooh, technology. Now we got touch dial phones, right? Now it's still got the cord. You can pick it up, and now you can just touch dial. Um, and then they got really fancy uh, and made them cordless, right? I don't know what the order was of, of, of all the technology transforming, but I saw it all happen right before my very eyes. Um, and then it went a step, I'm going somewhere with this. Um, technology went to a whole nother level um, where now you had voicemail. Um, up until this point, if somebody called your phone, you did not know who it was. Right? Somebody calls, you pick it up. Um, if, if your family was anything like mine, well, my grandmother, people don't do this nowadays, but uh, at my grandmother's house, um, this was the family house. She left the door unlocked. All you had to do was give it a little knock before you came in so that they knew somebody was entering. I know this sounds foreign to y'all. I'm, I'm from Columbus, Ohio, but we, it, it still had a good old, somewhat southern country feel. Um, she's like, mm, I don't know about that, I know. Um, so we come in, if the door rung, anybody in the house could answer the phone. But we answered the phone, the last name was Pinnell, Pinnell residence, right? Anybody could answer the phone, but nobody ever knew who it was. There was no way to know who it was. Um, they got really fancy with voicemail, um, to where, uh, once somebody called, you could hear them leaving the message and then you could even pick up. Or <laughs> if it was somebody you ain't want to talk to, you just listen to the message all the way through and just let them leave it and come back to it later. Y'all ain't do none of that. Um, it wasn't until, it wasn't until uh, they got caller ID that some of y'all stop answering the phones or becoming very selective when you answered the phone. Uh, because it was then that you could recognize the caller before you actually had to pick it up, right? I, I remember the doors not even having peepholes, that you had to figure out who was at, who was at the door by, <laughs> right? Some of y'all understand that. Um, here's the thing. There was no real way for them to know that it was Jesus, except by maybe two things, two things that seemed to be pretty evident throughout the walk and throughout the life of Jesus for them. To, there was many things, but, but two things that are really evident. 
Um, the Word of God says that you should know a tree by its fruit, right? Um, they could have recognized Jesus by his fruit, by his works. But interesting enough, at this moment, it seems like everything around them wasn't working, right? I don't see any fruit of Jesus around me because everything happening around the boat doesn't really look like Jesus. This doesn't look like, oh my God, this doesn't look like something Jesus would allow. This doesn't look like something that Jesus would do. I know Jesus and he sent me out here. He sent the disciples ahead of him. Y'all, oh my God, y'all got to get this. He sends the disciples ahead of, him, ahead of them. He says, I need to stay here for a little bit and calm the people, but I'll catch up with you, right? He sends them ahead. They're in the will of God. They're doing what Jesus told them to do. But why is it that I'm in the will of God, but then everything else around me looks contrary to Jesus? Here's the second thing. Could have recognized him by his fruit. Or they could have recognized him by his voice. Think about it. Somebody comes and knocks on the door. We don't quite have the peepholes yet. This is back in the day. <clears throat> so what do you say? Who is it? Before the phones had caller ID, somebody calls. If you don't recognize the, oh my God, I'm going to come back to that. If you don't recognize their voice, you ask, Y'all ain't say it like that. Some of y'all, who this? <laughs> you would ask, who is this? Because you don't recognize the voice. Ooh, that's good. I'm going to come back to that. I'm going to stick a pin right there. Um, normally when you're in dark seasons, when you're in chaotic seasons, um, you can't always go by what it looks like. Like, you can't go by what you see. Sometimes, here's the good part, sometimes all you have to go on is a word from God. This is what he says. It says in verse 19, it says, Then the sea arose because a great wind was blowing. So when they had rowed about three or four miles, Jesus, uh, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and drawing near the boat, and they were afraid. But he said to them, it is I. Do not be afraid. He speaks to them. They now hear his voice. They now have a word from God. They recognize his voice because they had spent time with him. If they had not recognized the voice, then even when he said, it is I, they would not have known who it was. Imagine, again, in these times where you didn't have um, caller ID, when we didn't have a peephole, and you say, who is it? And they say, it's me. Who is me? Right? Stop playing. Open the door. No, you better identify yourself. Right? Because you don't recognize the voice. Um, I was in my office one day, um, and... I don't know why, was, I don't normally do this, but it was late at night and I had all the lights off and all I had was my laptop up. Um, and I had the screen on full brightness, right? It's completely dark, got my laptop on, full brightness. Um, my wife walks into the room. I don't hear her, I don't see her. And then I don't even remember what she said, it was a while back, I don't remember what she said. But she said something to me, and I jumped. Um, because I wasn't expecting, y'all follow me on this, I wasn't expecting her to be in the room. Um, let me see how I can say this. Um, there have been moments where all the lights have been out completely. Where I was expecting her to be in the room. And it didn't catch me off surprise because I was expecting her. I hope y'all caught that. 
Y'all might catch it later. Um, it says that, uh, it says, but he said to them, it is I, do not be afraid. Why would they have been afraid? I'm going to just give you a few seconds to think about this. Why would they have been afraid? Um, it says in verse 19, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and drawing near to the boat, and they were afraid. Why would anybody be afraid of Jesus drawing near? Do y'all see that? <clears throat> I was afraid because she came in a way that I was not expecting. The disciples were familiar to Jesus coming in the light. They were familiar with how he had been doing things until he threw him a curveball. He came in a way that he's never come before. How do we respond to God when he shows up in a situation in a way that we've never seen him show up before? When he provides in a way that he's never provided before. When he shows up in a way that we've never seen him do it before, it makes us a little bit uneasy. We become scared. It says that he draw near and they became afraid. They became afraid of him getting closer. I, I mean, I would maybe understand if, if, if they got afraid with him leaving. God, I'm afraid of you leaving me. We need you here. They were afraid because he was coming closer. I don't know about y'all, but, but sometimes it makes me a little bit uneasy the closer that Jesus comes in. Because the closer we get to Jesus, the more he reveals things in us that we didn't know was in there. The more he shows us, us. The more we see the dirt on the inside that we thought that we had already cleaned out. You don't believe me? Go to uh, Matthew chapter, maybe is it 14? Matthew chapter 14. Let me see if this is it. Let me see if this is where I want to go. Matthew, oh, yes, it is. Matthew chapter 14. Um, <clears throat> this is interesting. This is the same passage, just in a different gospel. Matthew gives a little bit more detail than John. Y'all just follow me just for a second for this. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. While he sent the multitudes away, and, uh, and when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now, when evening came, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now, on the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled saying it is a ghost, and they cried out for fear. All of that sounds about the same. But then Mark, uh, Matthew introduces a part that John doesn't include. It says, but immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, be of good cheer, it is, uh, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered. This is the part that's not in John. Watch this. We know how this part goes. Peter says, um, Lord, if it is you, if it is you, you. Here's the reason why he was afraid. He didn't even know that it was Jesus. Fear set in because he did not recognize him. He didn't. Jesus said, it is I. He did not recognize the voice of God. I wonder how often God has given you instructions, but fear sets in because you don't know that this is God telling you to do it. Nah, this, 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 this can't be God because if it was, then I would already have everything in place in order to get started. Nah, this can't be God because if this were God, I wouldn't be experiencing the adversity. 
Because if it was God, then I would have favor. And I'd be walking on this little golden path on the way to my purpose, and nothing would hinder me and stop me from it. How do you handle adversity? It speaks directly to your faith. It says that Peter was afraid because he did not know that it was Jesus. He says, if it is you, then bid me to come. Right? This is what he says. If it is you, Jesus, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, come. And Peter came down the boat, walked on the water to go to Jesus. Y'all see this? Peter walks on the water. Tell me who else in the Bible walked on the water other than Jesus and Peter? That's, that's uh, you, you in pretty good, you in pretty good company, right? Um, Peter has done something that Paul didn't do. As great as Paul was, as much as the Bible as he wrote, Um, Peter does something that Solomon doesn't do, the one who the Bible says uh, had the most wisdom, right? Um, Peter does something that David did, that David did not do, who was a man who was considered after God's own heart. Peter did something that Moses didn't do. I mean, Moses parted the water, could he if not just walked on it? He, Peter did something amazing that nobody else did in the Bible, And you would imagine that this would come with an applause and a hand clap, but this is what follows. But when he saw the wind and was boisterous, he was afraid. Y'all see this? He was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, Oh, you of little faith. Whoa, wait a minute. Why did you doubt? Can you imagine being on this boat, being some of the other disciples? You not really having the guts to step out, but you watching Peter like, oh, yeah, that's my guy. Like, look how he stepped out on faith. Look how he stepped out and started that business, right? Look how he stepped out and started that group. Look how he stepped out and went after, you know, purchasing a new home, Look, look, look at how he stepped out and, and tried to transform his entire neighborhood. Look at he stepped out. And you're looking at all these people on social media. Look how they stepped out. Envious of people who stepped out. These are people that we're applauding. There's a, these are people that we are clapping for. These are, these are people that we are absolutely excited for that they stepped out. But stepping out doesn't mean that you have strong faith. Oh, y'all not talking to me today. Stepping out doesn't even necessarily mean that you believe that God is going to fulfill it. Now, that's the first step. It says that Peter was still battling with his faith. And Jesus' response is not a pat on the back like, okay, it's cool. Just get up and try again. It wasn't good job for trying. You almost hit the mark. It was, oh, you of little faith. Oh, you of little faith? Let's, let, let's stop right there. Let me, let me just talk to you for a second. Um, gosh. If I'm Peter, I can imagine that this is probably the moment where I get offended. This is probably the moment where I say, Jesus, um, Don't you see the rest of the the disciples that are still in the boat? Now, that's what fear looks like. That's my definition of fear is staying in the boat. That's my definition of fear, having the information and the knowledge, but still choosing not to do anything with it. That's my definition of fear. They were crippled by fear. They stayed in the boat. But Jesus gives another definition for fear. He says, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? Watch this. Peter in uh, in verse 28, he says, if it's you, if it's you, I don't know if it's you or not. Then after Jesus said, come, and when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water. But when he saw the wind uh, was boisterous, he was afraid. He allowed what was happening around him. Ooh, watch this. Um, there's another passage where, um, where Jesus is asleep on the boat. Y'all familiar with this passage? 
Jesus falls asleep on the boat. Um, then the winds and the waves start beating against the boat, right? Um, and then they, they become afraid and they say, Jesus, do you not care that we perish? Jesus wakes up, he rebukes the storm, but then he rebukes them. He says, you could have done this. I've given you power over this, right? Um, Ooh, this is a good one too. When they were in the garden of Gethsemane and Jesus said, pray just for an hour. He comes back. Now they're asleep, <laughs> right? Jesus was asleep at first. He wakes up, then he rebukes them. Now Jesus is awake praying and then they're asleep and he rebukes them. And he says, could you not watch just for one hour? He says, I need you to pray so that you don't fall into temptation, right? He even prays with Peter at one moment, and he says, Peter, Satan desires to sift you as wheat. But I pray for you that your faith fails not. Um, this is what I find to be interesting, that it's not so much about the wind beating up against your boat, it's not even so much about what you're going through and what you're experiencing. It has, follow me on this, it has very little to do with what storm you're experiencing. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what your situation is. I don't know if it's health related. I don't know if it's mental related. I don't know if it's something physical. I don't know if it's something going on with your family, with your job, with school, with finance. I don't know what it is. At the end of the day, it doesn't even matter. It doesn't matter what the storm is. Jesus' whole point was, do not allow what's going on on the outside to get inside. Y'all probably heard this before. You don't drown from going in water. You drown from water getting in you, right? Um, the ship doesn't sink because it's in the middle of the ocean. The ship sinks because the ocean gets inside the ship, right? And oftentimes we are distracted by what we are seeing, the adversity around us, the chaos around us, what's happening around us, the problem around us, the situation around us to the point that we allow what's happening to around us to get in us. And Jesus is trying to get something very important to them and the same thing that he's trying to get to us, that if we would recognize his voice, there are some seasons that all you will have is a word from God. <sighs> what do you do in situations when what you're seeing doesn't look like what God said about your situation? Woo! What do you do when you feel like you are in the will of God, but it seems like nothing around you is working. Oh my God. What do you do when there are problems? It seems like, like hyena just circling their prey. What do you do when the problem is encircling you? And you feel like, God, where are you? But all I have is a word. He says, it is I. You know what it also implies by him saying, it is I? That I'm standing right here, and I see everything that's happening. And though you feel like I'm not in the boat, I'm still in your situation. I still, God is a good father who sometimes, like me, will sit back from a distance and watch my child fumble a little bit. Watch them try to climb the tree, and they're asking for help, but I sit back from a distance, and I say, but let me, let me see how they handle this. I, I'm, I'm, I'm watching them uh, fight with a bee a little bit, but I, I just want, I, want, I want to see how they handle it. I see them fall and scrape their knee, but instead of running to them and picking them up immediately, I just want to see how you handle it. And you'd be surprised. Sometimes your child, if you act like you ain't looking, and they see that nobody is giving them the attention— They'll hop right up, dust off their knees, and keep playing. God is an amazing father who, just like Jesus in the water, will be looking from a distance. It says that Jesus saw them, that from a distance will see them. And for him to say, it is I, even from a distance. It didn't say he got in the boat. He said, it is I. 
which also implies that what's happening, he has permitted. Oh, I hope I get some help on this part. It also implies that what's happening around you that he has allowed. And if he has allowed it, it is also within his control. And there's obviously, thank you, Holy Spirit, there is obviously some fear that he is trying to work out of you. So he's allowing the storm to persist around you in order for the storm to push out the fear, right? The storm is not, oh my God, the storm is not here to scare you. The storm is, the storm is here to strengthen you. He is trying to build you up to get you to a place where you no longer fear what you see. But now you have faith for what he spoke. Woo! He is trying to build you up to a place. I can't even say it again. I hope y'all caught it. Somebody take a note on it. I've been way off my notes, y'all. We ain't looked at the notes. He has given me a charge to charge you today that you are no longer to walk in fear. I don't, I know this sounds harsh. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care how it feels. I don't even care what the situation is. It's not that I'm not empathetic. It's that I know who my strength comes from. I know who my help comes from comes from I know who is in charge of my life and even like Job if he permitted it he still so he till he still told Satan you can't touch his life you can touch everything else around him you can take his family you can take his wife you can take his kids you can take his health you can take his possessions you can take his money you can take his house but you cannot touch his life There is something that God is trying to produce on the inside of you that would not come to fruition unless he allowed a storm. A storm. God, I thank you for the storm. I thank you for the turmoil. I thank you for the persecution. These are moments in our lives that God has given us an opportunity to shoot up our hands, even in the midst of it, and to say thank you. God, I thank you for the opportunities that you give me to point my, uh, my affection on you. Oh, Jesus, thank you, Holy Spirit. Listen, Satan is a liar. He is the father of it, which means that everything that he gives birth to is a lie as well which means that everything that he produces, everything that comes out of his mouth, you ever met a pathological liar? That's all they know how to do, right? He is a liar. He is a deceiver. This is what I do. I'm going to try to help you all this morning. Anytime Satan feeds me a lie, anytime I go into a place and he says something like, you don't deserve this. Anytime I walk into a big house and I'm looking around, I'm like, man, this is beautiful. And he speaks to me and says something like, you'll never have anything like this. Um, Anytime I'm passing by somebody on the highway and they drive by in a really nice car that I think I might want one day. And I say, man, you know what? That'd be nice. And he says, "Mm, you'll never have that. Anytime he comes to me and I feel maybe like a little pain in my side and he says, man, you know what? It's probably cancer. You know what? you, You probably need to go check, go get checked out. You're probably dying, right? In any of those moments where Satan comes with a lie, because I know it's a lie, I also know, hmm, it's almost like Satan helps you without even knowing it. Because by him lying to you, it's almost like, thank you for showing me where I need to put my attention. Thank you for showing me where I need to put my, 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 my focus. Thank you for highlighting it because I didn't see it. Matter of fact, my faith was starting to wean. I didn't think that God could heal me. But now that you've lied to me and told me that this is all that I will ever be and that I'll never get over this. Thank you, Satan, because now you're giving me a you're giving me a focal point. You're showing me maybe what God is trying to heal. You're showing me maybe what God is trying to do in my life because all you can feed me is lies. I don't know about y'all, but I get indignant. I get mad. I get frustrated. Anytime he lies to me, anytime he tries to feed me some deception, I get upset. It makes me want to go into my prayer closet and just start tearing stuff up for no reason. It makes me want to shoot up my hands and get loud with my worship and my praise. I don't know how you handle adversity, but it makes me mad. It makes me angry. 
When he's messing with my family, it makes me angry. When he's messing with my health, it makes me angry. When he's messing with my money, it makes me angry. At what point will you allow this storm to push you into Jesus instead of away from him? How much more will it take for you to focus your energy on Jesus, to walk on the waves even in spite of the boisterous winds and waves around you? My God, what would have happened if Peter would not have feared and he would have kept walking on the water to Jesus? <clears throat> what would have happened if Peter would have got it sooner? Let me finish on this note. Um, I never like seeing anybody fall. I'm, I'm not the type of person who, who when people fall from grace, I'm, I'm rejoicing. I'm like, oh, that's what, that's, that's what they get. Um, I'm, not the, I'm not even the type of person who, if I'm applying for a situation and somebody else is in that position, that they get fired and I rejoice because they got fired, right? I don't rejoice in anybody's downfall. Um, man, but it's something about Peter falling in the water that somehow brings me consolation. It's something about Peter falling um, that kind of helps me feel like Man, that, 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 like, I feel like that. I feel like there's been many moments in my life where my attention was set and focused on Jesus. And I said, Jesus, if, if this is you, just give me a sign. Jesus, if, if this is you, just, just, just show me what to do. Just confirm it. He confirms it. He shows me. I step out. I mess it up. There's something about seeing Peter fall that makes me feel like, man, you know what? I can still get back up. This is the same Peter that Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church. Why could have Jesus not just waited for Paul? We've been talking about Paul the last few weeks, right? Why couldn't he have just waited for Paul? Why couldn't he have made it Matthew? This was the one that Jesus loved. I mean, uh, John, this is the one that Jesus loved, right? Why, why, why couldn't he have put, picked somebody else? He had a reason. This is the person. When he said, Peter. Satan desires to sift you as wheat. I'm praying for you that your faith fail not. Hey, uh, Peter, O ye of little faith, why does he keep picking on Peter? Because Peter is the one that he wants to use to build his church on. Sometimes it seems unfair. Sometimes it seems unbearable. But if God is allowing it, obviously he is trying to build up the person that he created to be able to walk out the purpose that he created you for. And there are some things that only come by trials, tribulations, and storms that you would not have gotten any other way. How can you graduate without a test? How can you be promoted with some type of problem that you had to overcome? When you apply for a job, one of the first things they ask, hey, tell us about a situation uh, where things didn't quite go your way and how did you overcome it, right? I want to know what you've been through. I want to know what you've overcome. I want to know what different adverse situations and problems you've had to face that has made you the person that you are today. And I know sometimes it feels like Jesus is picking on you, but the word of God says that he chastises those he loves and he loves you so hard that he can't stand to allow you to stay where you are so he allows different situations to light that fire under your behind because you know that if he didn't then you would still be there today you know that if you didn't experience some of the problems that you went through that you would still be in that bondage you know that some of y'all probably wouldn't even be living in the city of Charlotte unless there was some pe pressure applied to you. That some of you wouldn't be on the job that you're on unless somebody applied some pressure to you, right? There, there are things that God is trying to get to us, but that he allows to happen around us. But don't allow what's happening around you to infect or overpower what's happening in you. Everybody stand to your feet. Let's pray. Father... We thank you for your word today. I uh, thank you that you're raising up believers. Hallelujah. I, don't know who this is I told the team this morning, 
and I'll tell y'all the same. We have an outreach today. And the weather looks like it's probably still going to rain pretty hard. And guess what? We're still going out. Winds and waves are boisterous around us. But there's still something that we need to accomplish. God, I thank you that you're raising up leaders. You're raising up soldiers. You're raising up warriors that are not afraid of wind. That are not afraid of waves. That are not afraid of a little bit of rain a little bit of water that are not afraid of adversity. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Um, the Word of God says, count it all joy. Count it all joy. When you fall into diverse temptations, Man, it's, it's, it's incredible <clears throat> that we're to count it all joy, that the Word of God says, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Man, it's amazing that Jesus would have us in a place that feels very uncomfortable, that would have us to continue to push through the pressure that seems unbearable, and that somehow... The things that are not working are somehow working together for his will. Father, I thank you that we are not afraid. We are not fearful. Father, I thank you that what you have called us to that we will accomplish. Father, I am praying for the individual this morning under the sound of my voice who everything around them looks contrary to your word. Yeah, but the most important part is that we still have a word. Father, we will stand on your word even in seasons when things don't look like they line up with what you have spoken. Father, I thank you that we will stand on your word even when you are giving us a hard thing to do. God, I thank you that we will stand on your word even like Abraham when the instructions that you give us look like they are opposite to your character. Father, I thank you for your word. Help us to better recognize your voice, especially in seasons where we're hearing so many other voices. God, I thank you for wisdom and counsel and, and, and natural advice. Father, but I thank you for your word because that's the only thing that will stand forever. All we need is a word from you, Lord, and we'll be sustained in every season. Thank you for your word and declare it over us, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you for your word, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Father, I pray that you are making that you are making ears sensitive to your voice today. Oh God. God, I thank you that you are breaking through callous hearts. That when we hear your word, that when we hear your voice that we will harden not our hearts. Hallelujah. Father, I thank you that deaf ears are being opened today. I thank you, God, that scales are falling off of their eyes even today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God, I thank you that even like Elijah, hallelujah, thank you, Holy Spirit, that you will open up their spiritual eyes to see that more is with us than who is against us. God, that you will cause them in the spirit to be able to see the chariots of fire that are working for them. That you'll open up their ears in the spirit to be sensitive. Hallelujah. God, I thank you. Hallelujah. God, we even dispatch your angels. Hallelujah. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Ministering angels. 
If you go back and read through Jesus in the garden, one of the gospels says that after he prayed, the angels came and ministered to him. Oh, my God. Father, I thank you for ministering angels whose job is to help us fulfill your will for our lives. I thank you for your Holy Spirit, who even when we don't have words in our most adverse situations, that even the utterings, even our tears, even, 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 even the words that we are not able to put together to form a sentence, Father, I thank you that your Holy Spirit makes intercession for us interpreting our groanings, interpreting our moanings, interpreting our tears, interpreting our feelings, standing in the gap even when we don't have language for how we feel. Lord, we thank you for your Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. God, that I thank you that you are making us stronger than before, strong as ever. That every adversity would be a stepping stone for promotion. That every adversity would be a stepping stone for promotion. Hallelujah. God, I pray that you'll be pleased with our faith. Hallelujah. And that for anybody today who has fallen, Father, that they would experience you personally as a redeemer. That you are a God that restores. Hallelujah. That regardless of how many times maybe we have fallen or fumbled the ball, Father, I thank you that you are still waiting for us with open arms to receive us again. God, I thank you for not throwing Peter away. Thank you for not throwing us away. Woo, Jesus. God, I thank you for not throwing us away. Thank you, Jesus. God, I thank you for being patient with us. I can't speak for y'all today. God, I thank you for being patient with me. Hallelujah. I just want to give him a moment to speak to you. Ah, declare your word over us, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. I'm not going to ask you to come to the front. But I believe there's somebody here this morning who you experienced a traumatic situation. And you've almost been pleading with God just to say, God, just give me some time. I just need a little bit more time to get over this. God, I can't let it go yet. I really want to, and it really hurts to hold on to it, but I, it just, it, I can't let it go yet. God, just give me some time to get over this and to get through it. The Spirit of the Lord says this morning, you do not have time. Because I have anointed you to redeem time. Therefore, what you are experiencing, what is holding you back from forgiving, is not only the thing that will set you free, but the people that I have called you to is the stronghold that keeps them in bondage. The time is now. Let it go. No, this is what he said. He said, let it fall. Thank you, Holy Spirit. 
Holy Spirit corrected me. He said, let it fall. And what I saw was, it's not that you're holding on to it. It's that it's holding on to you. Oh, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. You've been asking Holy Spirit to give you time to let it go. But you don't have control. You're not able to let it go because it has you. This morning, Holy Spirit says, let it fall. Let it fall. Oh, my God. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Oh, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Woo! Oh, my God. Oh, Jesus. I heard the sound of a chain hitting the ground. And Holy Spirit said there is a sound that will be released once you let it fall. And the captives are waiting for a sound that will be a signal that they have permission to be free. And until they hear that sound, that they will remain in bondage. There is a sound of freedom that will come as a result of you letting it fall. Oh my God. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Mm, thank you, Holy Spirit. <sighs> you won't hear the sound, but you'll feel the release. Those that you have been called to will hear the sound and get their release. You've been waiting for a moment, a definitive moment, where you will feel in your feelings, you will feel the release. But the Holy Spirit says this morning, I wish I could make it more deep, but when the Holy Spirit speaks, I can only give it how he gave it to me. Holy Spirit says it is a decision to let it fall. And at the moment you make that decision and it falls, that those who are connected to you will get their release and you'll see it happen easily that those who are connected to you, that in conversations, even this week, I see immediately, straightway, and suddenly. Even in conversations this week, things that you have been praying for, interceding for, that you have been believing for, for those people, you'll have a conversation and they'll share with you the testimony of something that was released over their life as a result of what fell from your life today. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I thank you for every situation, every need. Father, you see it. You know it. Each individual that walked into this room, each individual online streaming under the sound of my voice, Everybody in here stands in need of something. And there is something adverse to what we are believing for. 
Many of us, what we're currently experiencing is contrary to what we are expecting. Father, but I thank you today for this, for this declaration, for this word. Father, I thank you that we are maybe going back to the same problem. Y'all hear me? That we may be going back to the same situation. And that maybe the situation didn't change. Maybe the storm didn't cease. Maybe, maybe our circumstance still looks the same. Father, but I thank you for something that you did in us. That even if the waves persist on the outside, Father, I thank you that we have peace on the inside. Even if the problem is still there Monday morning, Father, I thank you, God, that we are settled in, in ourselves. Hallelujah. God, I thank you that today we are stronger because of what we have been through. God, I thank you that today we are stronger because of what we have overcome. Hallelujah that we're better for it. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Good morning, everyone. We hope you enjoyed the service today. In case you missed any part of the message, no worries. All of our messages are archived on our YouTube channel. Feel free to click the channel, subscribe to the channel, and hit the notification button so you get all the latest videos that we have as soon as they air. If you are blessed by the message today and you feel led to sow into the ministry, you can do so online on our website or via our cash app. For more information about the upcoming events, please follow us on our social media platforms on Facebook and Instagram. Feel free to share anything that you've learned today with a friend and invite them to join you next week right here on our live broadcast. Lastly, thank you so much for tuning in to Flow in Life, where we love God, love people, and we live life. This is living.